I'm Jane Day, a Baptist minister, and alongside my colleague, Dr. Helen Cameron, we are involved in a research project called Project Violet. Project Violet is an ambitious project for our Baptist movement, which aims to investigate women's experiences in ministry whilst developing women ministers. The project will help us to understand more fully the theological, missional, and structural obstacles women ministers face in the Baptist community in Great Britain and identify steps forward. Project Violet has never been done before. It has and continues to be a small step of faith that we hope will have a big impact and lead to big changes upon generations of women and men in our missional settings. Mission today can mean so many different things for different people. For me, at its simplest level, I think it's about taking a step forward in response to God's invitation and saying a wholehearted yes. I draw my inspiration from Mary, the mother of Jesus. It's a great story. Mary is visited by an angel and I think the whole world waited with bated breath for her to say yes, which she did, and the rest is history. A small step for Mary led to quite significant changes, perhaps more than she bargained for. It might put the yeses that you and I say into perspective, whatever we say yes to. Saying yes takes immense courage. I wonder when you last said yes. I wonder what small steps you have taken recently in response to God's invitation. You see, small steps always lead to big changes. I'm off to meet someone today whose family has a history of saying yes and taking steps that have led to big changes. Uh, we're here in the heart of London and today I'm with Helen Pankhurst. Uh, I'm delighted to meet Helen and although we work in different contexts, we share a focus of encouraging women and offering them opportunities to find their voice. Helen is the great granddaughter of Emmeline Pankhurst and granddaughter of Sylvia Pankhurst, who were both leaders in the suffragette movement. Helen, we work in different contexts and um, uh, I know something of your story and I'd just be really interested um, and curious, uh, what is it like, Helen, to live with the Pankhurst surname and the legacy of that? Yeah, um, I guess firstly I don't have any counterfactual, so I don't know what it would have been like without. I could have um, changed it on marriage, I could have got rid of the name and I could have um, not passed it on to my children. Um, but it's given me so much. It's given me that connection to the past, a chance to reflect, to share with others. And almost daily, I would say, I receive some form of interest from mainly women, but not only, um, who talk about the relevance of that surname in their own lives still today. So I am really, really proud of that surname. It's meant more and more. It's, I mean, I carry it with more and more pride and it's more and more important in my own life and in the things that I end up doing. Uh, in 2018, Helen, you wrote a, a wonderful book, Deeds Not Words, and uh, it wonderfully depicts uh, the story of women and some of the past struggles that women have faced. Uh, and it also shines a light uh, on current challenges that women experience. Uh, I'd just be interested to hear about how you, um, you know, hear literally some of the challenges that women present today. Um, yeah, um, they're interrelated and complex would be the first thing that I would say. I mean, when I wrote the book, I was interested to see how much things had changed or not changed in the last hundred years or so, and also whether there were certain factors that felt like they were pulling women backwards in certain areas where we'd progressed the most. And each of the chapters reflects on that, and I encourage people, and I myself kind of scored each of the chapters in order to get that sense of, have we moved better in some areas than in others? And I started with the polit politics, and obviously I started with that because you know, that links to the heritage. and. 
narrowly in terms of numbers of women in Parliament, in terms of women in the Cabinet, etc., we still have quite a way to go. So yes, women can vote, and yes, women can be represented, but in terms of representation, it's something, I think it's 34% of women in um, the House of Commons, it's 27% of the Cabinet, it's 29% in the House of Lords, we still have male hereditary uh, peers. So purely on a numeric um, aspect, we've got lots to go. We still got far to go. And then if you think about the policies and how women feel in those spaces, women MPs will tell you that there's still a way to go. Um, their experience of misogyny, um, of violence, online violence, etc. The fact that policies are still not gendered, the fact that maternity issues are still so problematic within Parliament and within any political space, so take that to local councils, etc. Take that to any political space, there's still a lot to be done. So yes, progress, but a way to go. And you could look at any other aspect, so economically, socially, culturally, um, in terms of spaces around religion, in terms of violence. And I'm pausing when I come to violence because of all of the areas that I've looked at, also culture, you know, sports, there are many areas where we can say there's progress and the women, the suffragettes of, of of late, you know, of the past, if they came and looked at the world today, they would be able to say, yeah, great, but, and the but would be most loud, I think, when it comes to violence, because every single woman and girl in most countries in the world still have a curfew about where they can be at what time. And this sense of personal fear because of their gender is universal. And then there's all sorts of other forms of it, you know, all sorts of uh, misogyny and violence related issues. But purely the fact that as women, we still have this concern, I think is shocking. You know, I talked to an 18, yesterday, I was talking to an 18 year old girl who talked about never in the evening traveling alone and always there's a peer support thing to make sure that there's somebody there. You know, why? Why do we still have that personal violence, that personal fear of violence? Um, so, you know, you asked me how much things had changed and um, what my assessment is. And it is that we have a lot of progress. There's so much more to be done. It's interrelated. But fundamentally, one of the measures of the problems is that we still have this fear around our personal safety, our physical well-being. Sure. I initially reflect on that and hear stories, as it sounds like, almost on a daily basis, Helen. Um, what are your thoughts on how we might re respond to that? Um, yeah, and I think we have to keep that optimism. You know, there's a sense of frustration. It's more than 100 years. I mean, surely we could have done better. Um, but the optimism, I think, comes from, so then what? So what can we do? And the way I tend to look at this is that there are three different angles to it. Firstly, there's the agency of individuals. We can all make a difference in the language that we use around perpetuating inequalities, in the actions that we make, in our personal commitments to not just let things slip, to actually make a stand, to make a difference. All of us, individually, small actions can make a difference. That's one element. The second is collectively, there's the whole issue around norms, traditions, attitudes, and we can only challenge those by coming together to make a stand on whatever spaces those cultural issues um, operate in. And then the third is around policies and structures and the systemic systems that perpetuate inequality. And I think we need to bring all three of those together, the agency, the round issues around social norms and the structures. And if you do, then that's when really things change. But even if they don't, even if it's piecemeal, each element can make changes. We can do it individually. We can have policy changes and we can tackle social norms and traditions. The magic is when those suddenly can come together. Sure. And do you know how to create that magic, Helen? <laughs> I wish, I wish. <laughs> sure, um, me too. <laughs> well, me too is a yeah. very interesting example sure. of where maybe that exactly mm. that happened. Individuals challenged, they came together and policies um, changed as a result. So now and again, I think almost it's linked to these waves of change, isn't it? The feminist waves are maybe moments when that happens. But you don't, we don't need to wait for them. The individual changes, the structural changes with particular policies, particular institutions, particular religious institutions in the case in which we're talking about, they can also make that moment, that catholic moment in their spaces. And I think that's also critical. Sure. So an individual kind of advocacy agency and certainly the collective. 
Uh, Helen, I'm often asked by men, uh, what is it that men can do, for example, you know, in, in all these issues that we're talking about uh, and the challenges that women face? So, yeah, I mean, men are part of this story in terms of, again, the agency that they can bring, their own lives, their own attitudes, their own positions, what they do. So they are agents of change or they are agents perpetuating the change. So they have a choice to make. Either they are part of the problem or they're part of the solution, just like women are. There's, there's no difference. Women are as complicit in many of these problems as men are. So I think that's one element. And then the other is they hold more power. So they have their agency can transform a lot more collectively and in terms of structures. So I guess the plea, the ask of men is to use that power and be part of the change because they can do so much more in that position of power. And as allies, boy oh boy do we need them because otherwise the possibilities of regression are there. They're there in all spaces and they're there in religion in particular. Sure. And I'm often asked um, from different generations in the work that I do, Helen, some kind of senior women in age, for example, um, uh, you know, look back and say, well, we've come a long way. And then kind of new people or younger women rather uh, are saying we're still faced with kind of misogynistic attitudes, you know, within the church, patriarchal power and abuse of power. Um, what might your thoughts be around that in terms of, again, challenge and yeah. solution? Yeah, I, and, you know, we talk about intersectionality nowadays, which is understanding that different people are not just women or men. They come with certain other privileges or, um, or vulnerabilities, and that can be around age, it can be around race, it can be about ability um, and many other factors. I think that for older women who have that perspective of having seen change in their lifetime, in a way what they're doing is they're looking back. They're looking back and saying, well, for my life, it's changed from here to here and therefore this is brilliant. They're not looking forward. Whereas young people don't have that background, they're looking forward, they're looking to their future and they're saying, yeah, but right now, this isn't good enough. We're still, you know, 30% of women in parliament. We still got sexism, violence, all the other factors. And so they are wanting to move forward. And, I, and my plea to anybody with more privilege, or in this case with women who are older and who have this perspective of, yes, things have got better, is to look forwards, not backwards. And that's an active choice. And it's a choice about positioning yourself with the next generation, thinking about your children, your grandchildren, and thinking, is this good enough or can we do better? And if we can do better, can I be part of that? Rather than saying, oh, well, yeah, better than in my day. So looking forward, which is what we'd like to think we're doing as a Baptist denomination uh, and investing uh, in a project, Project Violet, uh, but being quite intentional uh, about exploring some of the systemic issues that women face. Uh, with a view to bringing about change. Uh, I wonder what your advice or words of wisdom might be to us, Helen, as a, a Baptist denomination uh, in terms of encouraging uh, women and changing cultures across the church. Yeah, I mean, I really love what I've heard about Project Violet because it's doing just that. It's stopping, it's questioning, it's looking at power imbalances, it's saying, what can we do? Rather than just saying, well, it's always been like this and let's just continue it saying hang on let's stop let's reflect let's listen and let's do better so I think that is that is the, the road to change and um, I would say that thinking about agency social norms and structures so the structures of the church the norms the traditions the patterns of who does what and how and why and who says what and how and why and how you create create different different ways of saying things and doing collectively is important and then every single person who's in that faith can make a difference either perpetuate or be part of the change so for me that structure i think still applies and then remembering all of these intersections so it's not just about um the religion it's also about understanding economics the economics of how people live it's about the politics of how people live it's about safety so taking on board the multi-dimensional aspect of women and men's lives and thinking about where those changes can happen beyond the narrow confines of the church i think was really important 
Yeah, I, I would certainly echo that, Helen. And uh, it's not just a, a, about church, certainly, and uh, beyond an economic and other issues that you've touched on. Thanks, Helen. It's been really good to meet you today, and uh, we appreciate all that you do in your work, and we wish you well. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much. I've been so encouraged today to meet with Helen Pankhurst and I want to encourage you to keep taking small steps of faith individually and collectively. For more information about Project Violet and to keep up to date visit www.projectviolet.org.uk